Hi, this is Spencer Dobson. And this is Corey Heidelberger. And this is the Dakota Free Press Podcast. I'm doing great. How are you, Spencer? Not too bad. We had a moment of snow yesterday, and I almost freaked out. And I should point out, the last time we recorded this, I had to walk through a foot of snow to get here. <laughs> but it has melted, and spring is springing. It um, feels springy to me. Although, whatever snow fell yesterday, I was in a classroom with no windows. So you miss so much of the world when you're teaching in a room with no windows. Since when can you have a classroom with no windows? Oh, I think every school building I've been in. Since I started teaching in the 90s. I I went to school in a high school in Madison that had numerous interior classrooms with no access to the outdoors. Really? I'd come to school in the morning and barely see the sunlight. I'd stay and do debate and I'd walk out at night. I'd have no idea if it rained, snowed, thundered, or whatever. Does it look out onto the hallway or something? Is there... Um, Through one little crenellated window, you get a view of the dark hallway, which also, as I recall, had no windows. Is there a slot that they slide food in through and... I know food. I never even get food in my classroom. What are you talking about? That's up to me. No, that, I, that some, some windows and you know the schools here in uh, in Aberdeen. It's it's a mix. There are some classrooms that are entirely interior. There are some classrooms like at Simmons that have these big, beautiful windows that face out to the east. But so often I walk in and the teachers have the blinds closed. And I'm like, oh, you've got this view. Wow. You close your windows. Give me a break. Sun, let the sun shine in. Kids learn better with vitamin D. Well, maybe they don't want them to be distracted by butterflies and dogs running by. And, and, <laughs> and their minds will turn to thoughts of spring and the fancy of love or something like that. Hey, uh, if you're listening to this and you like it, please throw a couple of bucks in the tip jar, right? If, uh, if you found this, you probably found it right on the Dakota Free Press blog. If you look over to your, let's see, it would be your right. On your yeah, right. It would be on your right. And you go down a little bit. There's a literal picture of a tip jar. I think he's also going to put, you can embed it into the, 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 the write up on this. Absolutely. We'll put a link down at the bottom there if you there like you what go. you hear. If we do a good job today, let us know. Help us keep right. the lights on. Just send some money through PayPal. And if you're a Republican and you like to hate listen to this, be a member of the free market and throw us some money so that you can continue to hate listening to this. Because if you don't hate support us, we will go away and then you'll have to hate something less good. And hey, Republicans, you know that you're going to learn the best opposition arguments listening to us. So, you know, just keep that conversation going. Help us out. There you go. Oh, and we have our first guest today who isn't one of us. Uh, Our guest is a professor at uh, NSU. Her name is Sarah Christensen Blair. And we're going to talk about uh, art and the importance of art and why the NEA is important and why we should use our precious tax dollars just a little tiny bit. Like you can fund the NEA with one or two trips to Mar-a-Lago, I think. Uh, At least that, yes. Yeah, yeah, no problem. So uh, it, it is so absurd to have a budget talk when that number... The the pre, like I just saw the headline today like the president is breaking the secret service Mar-a-Lago costs a bajillion dollars every time he goes and we don't want to fund the NEA for God's sake. Well, That's I look ridiculous. forward to hearing what Sarah has to say about Me that. Me too, and we'll get to that at the end of the show. Let's uh, let's do the quick topics first. Okay, this one you're you're going to do the heavy lifting on this one, Corey. We're going to talk about SB fifty four. Oh, the campaign finance reform bill. Mm-hmm. This is replacing IM-22. Well, now, Spencer, be careful with that word replace. You put quote marks around that, right? Right. Okay, good. Yeah, and, I, and I, I caution you on that because Senate Bill 54 actually came from the Secretary of State. Uh, it was a proposal to handle the campaign finance side of Initiated Measure 22. Now, keep in mind, there was more than campaign finance in initiated measure 22 right the voters actually proposed we want some campaign finance reform we want lobbying reform we want an ethics commission there was a lot of stuff in that bill Mm -hmm. so even right there 54 by itself doesn't only seeks to replace uh maybe about half if that much less than half of what i am 22 did but which the legislature repealed there uh, it's 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 an audio medium so we can't hold the two pills up next to each other and you've got a whole there's a whole write up on it on the on the blog if people want to go point by point and and if you have the time i think you should look at it but a couple of things that really popped out at me for one thing uh, uh now businesses can contribute directly to politicians that because they're people yes that that well that is i think the central point about what our legislature did with campaign finance reform. Mm -hmm. And that's the central point why I will continue to say they didn't replace Mm -hmm. initiated Measure 22. The legislature did the opposite. 
the spirit. And you know, we, we don't have to get into the nitty gritty of what the you know section twenty two clause five said. Right. The spirit of initiated measure twenty two was the voters saying we want to check the power of big money in politics. Right. There's too much big money, too many big donations. We want to reduce the influence of big money and increase the influence of regular citizens. Mm -hmm. Senate Bill 54 does the opposite of that. Not only does it not reduce the amounts that you and I and PACs and whoever can give to candidates, it now authorizes businesses and labor unions and other groups to give money directly to candidates where they couldn't do that before in and, South Dakota. And you gave a very good example of that in the blog, which was if I own a business mm -hmm. and I like a candidate, I can give him $4,000 out of my pocket. Yeah, for, for like running for governor or attorney yeah. general. You and then my 4, business, Spencer's Tacos and, and, and Bikini Waxing or whatever my business happens to be, I can then take which would make fat stacks of cash so I can funnel all that sweet money <laughs> under the name of my business into your gubernatorial campaign as well. Now I'm double dipping or I'm, the, I'm doing the opposite of double dipping, but I'm double tipping. And certainly, right. as we can see from our current administration, when you throw out that kind of money, you're going to get preferential treatment. And as you noted in your example there, I mean, keep in mind, most business owners, the guy running the taco and bikini wax stand sure. on the corner, he's probably not making a lot Freddy? of bad money. Yeah, Freddie <laughs> Freddy the, the But he's stand. the best and he knows what he's doing. He's great. And he washes he's his doing. hands between jobs, which but, is very important. But he's probably riding a really thin profit margin. Right. So when saying, you know, a business, a business owner can give $4,000 right. personally and then go grab 4000 from the till. Yeah. Obviously, that kind of thing is going to favor the bigger businesses. Right. The bigger the business, the easier it'll be mm -hmm. for those owners to, like you said, double tip right. their favorite candidates. Which is why they wanted limits in the first place, so that it equals out how much people. You know, then everybody has the same the same say and the same the 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 the, the, the politician owes everybody the same amount. Right. That was the idea of IM twenty two. It was to say let's reduce how much you know right. the cap on what any individual entity can give. Which supposedly opens the door then for more individuals to have more say. It dilutes that influence of big money. Right. Allowing businesses to now give directly to candidates goes in absolutely the opposite direction. Right. So please, everybody, don't be fooled. Your legislature did not replace IM22 with what you wanted. Right. They replaced it with what politicians want, which is more money from business. Right. And there is there is a huge argument in America that uh, there are a group of people, uh, many of them in high position, that seem to believe that businesses are people. But then I say marry one. If if you really think that, why don't you date one for a while and Absolutely. then tell and then we'll make a reality show about it. This one's just kind of a warning, right? Because the Progressive Priorities Pack is doing robocalls and they're using a recording of Barack Obama and they're saying you give money and then Barack Obama will impeach Donald Trump. What's the problem with that? Yes, well, speaking of campaign finance, here's a problem where the money doesn't even appear to be going to campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, this group, you said, Progressive Priorities Pack, they are currently doing robocalls, and I've heard from a South Dakota reader. And this is their second name, by the way. I didn't, I should have, I, I did, right. I prepared for this very quickly, but they were like the conservative. Give us your money pack. Well, that's the thing. There's there's a, an overarching group right. that has been formed that apparently last year they formed a subgroup to raise money in Donald Trump's name. They right. were calling around the country during the primary and I think during the election saying, hey, we like Donald Trump, send us money. But their FEC reports from last year don't show any contributions to Donald Trump or any conservative cause. So to put that in very, very simple terms... They're collecting money and not sending it where they're saying it's going. Exactly. They're and, just keeping it. And last year... This, this is called a con. Group, yes, a con. This group was doing this under the auspices, you know, claiming to be working for Donald Trump last year, campaigning for Donald Trump. Now, this group with a different name, but the same information, is calling around, including to one of my readers in South Dakota, saying they're raising money to beat Donald Trump. They're mm -hmm. doing it on behalf of Barack Obama or whatever. It's a scam. And I did. Right. I, you know, I wrote on the blog, it reminds me of Annette Bosworth in 2014. Uh, when she ran for U.S. Senate here in South Dakota, mm -hmm. she raised over $2 million by sending out uh, direct mail to retirees in Florida and Texas saying, I'm going to beat Obama. Obama's coming for your health care and your guns. Send me money. Blah, mm -hmm. blah, blah. And she got 4% in the primary. 
Okay. It was a scam. Right. She wasn't trying to win the primary. She was trying to get $2 million right. to just spend on her own image. Pro- progressive Priority PAC appears to be doing the same thing. But at least she tried to run, right? She did actually well, run, Because, yes. I mean, you can certainly argue that, like, 15 of the 17 Republican candidates were trying to get a book deal. Right. Well, And, now, and a speaking job on Fox News, so... But to really go into it, there there was a group behind Annette Bosworth, the group she used to send her postcards and direct mailings mm-hmm. to you know retirees in Florida, Texas, wherever, is a group called Base Connect. Mm-hmm. And their scam basically is, yeah, we'll help you raise $2 million with our awesome mailing list. Uh, we're going to keep 70 to 80% wow. of that. So in that scam, people think they're sending money to beat Barack Obama. Really, they're just lining the pockets of Washington, D.C. Sure. insiders. Same thing with this progressive priorities pack, it appears. They're getting your money, but they aren't spending it on the political cause you think they're calling about. They're spending it on themselves. I highly doubt these are Washington insiders, though. These are a bunch of guys in a in an office in downtown whatever. Pardon me, yes. It, Insider it, 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 might not be the right word. They're in, Operators, they're whatever. In count, they're in council bluffs in a, in, a, in, a, in a strip mall with a phone bank. They're scam artists. Don't yeah, send them your scam money. Artists. Send us your money. Don't send those guys yeah, your money. We'll yeah. do a better job with it. And there are... And, and it just... The, the best way to protect yourself is do your homework. Go online, look up the organization, um, you know, and 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 look up what you want to contribute to, and uh, and and find out who's legit and who's not. And I should have done my homework. In fact, I'll find it and we'll put it in the thing. There is a charity watch and a donations watch organization that if you're not sure, you know, if you're not sure where your organization is spending their money, they will do the homework on it. And I don't know if that works if they do political stuff or if they just do. Um, Charitable things. If, if they don't, there are other outfits like OpenSecrets.org and, and the Federal Election Commission you know, uh, you uh, website itself. They, they, they have all these filings. And if you hear from a group and their papers aren't, aren't online, don't trust them. Yeah. You know, talk to these people. Make a real person talk to you. Ask them questions. Check around. Yeah, And this information is out there. So just be careful. Be wise. Yeah. Money. And of course, please give to charity. Please support political organizations you believe in. Please support us. But... Be careful and do your homework. That's Absolutely. all. Absolutely. Moving along, uh, let's go in depth now, uh, and, and and you're going to have music here. And we'll find it's, something. It's, it'll be fine. Or uh, I'll get Ezra to bark. That would be that would be good too. This is from a story by uh, Roger Whittle and Eliza Sand. It was on Sunday's Aberdeen American News. If you did not subscribe, please do. Please support your local press. Um, basically, uh, South Dakota delegates don't favor. Uh, Cuts to subsidized air service. And uh, I did not even know that was a thing, to be honest with you. But you're talking about the, this. it's called the Essential Air Service, the federal yes. subsidy for basically rural airports, right? Right. What did you find out in that article? I found out a lot in this article, and I did some more homework. But here's a quote directly from the article. After the Airline Deregulation Act uh, passed in 1978, and I'll go into that in a second, airlines were suddenly free to pick which cities they would serve and what they would charge for tickets. Uh, That meant that airlines could end less profitable routes and focus on larger airports with more passengers. So let me see if I understand that. Mm -hmm. Like before 1978, the federal government was saying to airlines, you have to provide service to this town, this town, this town. And here's how much it's going to cost. And they set limits on the fares, too. They said, here's what the fares are. Okay, so basically in 1978, the government said, no, we're going to just let the market decide. And by the way, prior to 1978, that's when you hear people talk about the golden age of air travel, that was when airlines put all of their energy into service. That's how you could differentiate. So that's when everybody wore the fancy outfits and you know the food was much better and the drinks were better and it was a big deal and that's when people wore suits to fly uh but in 1978 a uh, radical uh right-wing extremist jimmy carter oh i remember him sure. decided to deregulate it for good and for ill uh so let's go into the deregulation act of 1978 first uh like we just said before dere- deregulation uh the price of airline tickets was regulated by the government so airlines competed on service um, Jimmy Carter changed it. Now, what happened is deregulation, one of the things it did that worked out well was it created low-cost carriers that had few frills and cheap tickets. And Southwest is a prime example of a success story of that, but there's a bunch of them that are now gone because uh, it also opened the door for greater competition. So they figured out, the bigger airlines figured out how to do cheaper tickets, how to make more money. They were less worried about the greater good and more worried about just doing their job as best they could. So now... I don't know how many airlines there were, but now there are three or four, and that's pretty much what your choices are. Uh, as you may or may not know, it is not profitable 
to fly to places like Aberdeen. So we have to use government to subsidize uh, those flights to make sure people living in these areas have access to air travel. And I would like to address that to Roger, who called me a leftist on our blog, as an example. Oh, on our of, previous podcast. Yes, as an yes. example of using government um, to benefit the people. Uh, and I don't think that um, has an arch liberal agenda to it. I think uh, it's just if if... And, and our, our legislators agree. Everybody yeah. is mad about that. Like well, let me, let me check. To be, clear, apparent, uh, to be clear, apparently there was this deregulation in 78, mm -hmm. but since then we've created this new subsidy. That's yes. the essential air service subsidy. And right? it gets on the chopping block period pretty regularly. It sure. But although it was created because towns like, I think right now in South Dakota, this subsidy goes to the Aberdeen Airport. Yes. The 100, Air... 173 cities across the okay. country get this subsidy. Right. And it makes it possible for you to fly out of Aberdeen. So let's say you need to fly to the Mayo Clinic. Um, mm -hmm. Without the subsidy, you're not going to fly to the Mayo Clinic. Yep. Yep. Um, it also makes it possible for a lot of hunters and fishermen and, and, and tourists to fly into Aberdeen and to Rapid City and to Huron and a couple or, other... Or wait, I think it used to be Huron, but now it's Aberdeen, Pier, and Watertown. Yes. Those are our three that are served right yes. now by the subsidy. Okay, yes. yep, yep. You're absolutely right. Sorry about that. It's okay. But, and, and, and like I said, 173 other cities mm -hmm. around the country. So, long story short, if you do not live near a big city and you do not want to drive five hours to get to an airport, this subsidy benefits you tremendously sure now what are why are our congress people talking about this this has to do with the budget proposal right yes well because the budget wants to cut it and uh as uh will come up again in this podcast the the conventional wisdom uh on budgets and politicians is they put things out so that we can debate about them so that they can pull it back and then they can get what they really want which is less than what they put on the table uh, I don't think we're dealing with a conventional government. I don't think we're dealing with a conventional president. And I don't think we're dealing with a conventional budget. So I think our legislators are going to have to fight to make sure things like this and, and a number of other things. We're going to talk about the NEA in our interview today. Um, I think they. I, I, I think these guys are serious. I think they would love to get rid of this stuff. I think well, they'd love to get rid of Medicare. And, and the cut you're talking about, at least with essential air service, as well as National Endowment for the Arts, mm -hmm. Endowment for the Humanities, uh, community block grants, mm -hmm. some of these other programs, we're, you're talking about cuts that are 100% cuts. Yeah. They aren't saying, okay, we got 173 towns getting right. served by essential air service. Eh, let's pare that down a bit. They're just saying in general, none of these towns are worth it. None of this interference mm -hmm. in the market is worth it. Let's just cut all of that subsidy. Yeah. And this costs, again, I think this costs one or two trips to Mar-a-Lago. I think that's <laughs> the fine. And I don't know how many iPhones it costs to do this, but it's a lot of iPhones. It's not a lot of trips to Mar-a-Lago, depending upon what metric you like to measure your uh, your things by. Sure. Well, now, it, the essential air service, this idea that, you know, air service is something that we have to have in Aberdeen Pier and Watertown, as well oh. as Rapid City and Sioux Falls. Mm -hmm. It is an interesting question. Because I can see, and this is, you know, and listeners out there will know, there's still a conservative in me somewhere. Sure. And when we talk about economic matters like this, I like to go back to Adam Smith. Mm -hmm. No one more conservative than the father of the free market, right? Okay. Um, Adam Smith said, yeah, free, the free market is great. Capitalism is great. But there is a proper role for government. And he lists in his, in his book, Wealth of Nations, kind of the Bible for free market capitalism, he says there are three proper roles for government. The first is to protect us from threats from without, i.e. invaders, Russians, Cossacks, etc. Um, the second proper role of government is to protect us from dangers within. You know, criminals, thugs, gangs, uh, disasters, you know, bad things that happen within in our own country. The third proper role, and this is where you get probably the most debate, the third proper role for government is to do the things that the free market won't do by itself. Right. And, and to do important things, things that we need. So there's the question about air service. Yes, it's nice to be able to fly directly from Aberdeen to Minneapolis or wherever. It's nice, you know, in Watertown, they've got these flights that they do the hop. They go Watertown, Denver, or Watertown Pier, and then straight to Denver. Mm -hmm. Nice to do that instead of having to drive down to Sioux Falls to do it. And in the other direction, as, you know, the Fort Pier mayor, Lori Gill, said when she heard about the essential air service cuts, the, the airport is great for when tourists want to come right. into South Dakota, especially during hunting season. Right. They want to come in. They want to go right to Pier, go out to their hunting lodges within the area there. And same around Aberdeen and Watertown, a lot of pheasant hunting. 
do their hunting and fly back. They don't want to fly into Sioux Falls and then drive another three hours, four hours out into the, you know, into the James River Valley or out to the Missouri to do it. That right. cuts into that. That's a deal breaker for a vacation. But the Adam Smith question would be, OK, if there aren't enough hunters coming in and business travelers in Pier or Watertown or Aberdeen going out for the free market to make a profit on this, is it really important enough? for the government to spend tax dollars to support that? Or could those tax dollars be better spent elsewhere on National Endowment for the Arts, on education, on roads, or do we have enough to do all those things? That's an open question to me. Do we really need cheap airline service? Do we really need people from around the country paying for airplane tickets for people in Aberdeen. I, I, I'm open to debate. Well, it's he, not that cheap, first of all. Uh, right. Uh, yeah, I haven't flown out of Aberdeen. It's out of my price range. But it's cheaper than it would be without the subsidy, right? Absolutely. So, And, and it is 2017. Mm -hmm. And we do have business to take care of in other places. Yes. And uh, it, obviously, if no one was using it, uh, then the airport wouldn't be there. But clearly there's enough business that this debate is happening and enough people are coming in and out that this debate is happening. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, but you can understand why an airline is like, we just want to fly from you know Minneapolis to Las Vegas. And for some airlines, that actually is kind of what they do. But you are also providing a service. You know, if we only had the highways that were popular, it'd be a little rough for a lot of people. Of course, now, you know, highways too. The same thing applies there. We get subsidies here. We get federal funding in South Dakota for roads, and we've got more road per capita than more densely populated areas. Sure. So our, the same principle applies. Sure. Transportation in general, roads, airplanes, whatever, sparse rural states like ours are always going to come out ahead, and dense sure. urban places are going to subsidize roads for people in the country. Because, like you said, people in the country have to but, get business done, too. And, 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 and roads are obviously not just for tourism and for travel. They're for trucking. They're for transportation. They're for the police to come to your house when there's trouble, or the yeah. fire department, or you to get to town yeah. when you got to get to the hospital. Their I, transportation is essential. I assure you there are perfectly reasonable solutions to all of these problems and questions, and I think there is uh, a way to make it work relatively well for everybody uh, without losing sure. the airport in Aberdeen or shutting down the highways. Yeah, um, just saying, no, let's not do it at all yeah. seems kind of an abrupt solution. But what I find interesting is that, you know, even I as a liberal am open to the debate of the priorities of, okay, is, sure. is air travel essential? to places like Pier Aberdeen or Water and Watertown, or is road travel enough? And, you know, accept the fact that if you want to fly from Aberdeen, well, you're going to have to go up to Fargo or down to Sioux Falls. I'm open to that debate. Well, Interestingly, our, our Republican con congressional representatives, the ones who hoot and holler about being conservative, sure. who hoot and holler about free market, they're the ones who I think you're saying in that article says are to the, to the line saying, no, we must we must have essential air service. Well, it's and absolutely I, critical. And I, I feel like if they gave an inch, uh, if you especially when you're dealing with people who want to shut stuff down altogether, you just mm -hmm. have to go, no, we're not doing that. We're yeah. not going to entertain this. We're not going to play this. This is just not going to happen. And that'll be interesting to see because now we, you know, we have our Republican delegation from 61% well, uh, uh, of Trump, South Dakota, yeah. saying we don't like this part yeah, of the Trump yeah. budget. I mean, we when, want our air service. When this, and there's going to be a lot of budget stuff as, as this budget, which, and I don't think this budget is going to come together, quite honestly. Um, but now the fissures are starting you know, the, the rubber has hit the road. We're not talking about where uh, a minority of, of people go to the bathroom. We're talking about something real, uh, not something that, that if it impacts money. Uh, and, and that changes everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we get past the slogans of making America great. Right. And we get down to the nuts and bolts yeah. of can I fly from Pier to Washington? Or yeah. even from yeah. Christy Nome. Can yeah. I, when I fly back from Washington, can I fly right into Watertown? Right. Or am I going to have to fly to Sioux Falls and drive the extra 100 miles yeah. to get up to my home up near Castlewood and Haytai in that yeah. area? And this, That's a real practical difference. This isn't culture war stuff. They, they, right. they, they seem to really, because I mean, culture war stuff is distracting and it's easy to be like, I'm right. And you're scared, mm -hmm. but but this is this is nuts and bolts stuff. And yeah. I, and when uh, for everything, I haven't read the entire budget because who's got that kind of time? But the nuts and bolts stuff of the budget, um, it seems like uh, there it's it's falling apart. Basically. Right, and I, I feel like that too. That's why even on like I say, essential air service, I'm open to the debate. 
because I mean I don't fly much, sure. Um, so I guess I you know on a daily practical basis I don't have much invested, but I can see the economic argument about tourism, business sure. development, you know, convenience for our public officials to get more work done. It's, do you think three M? Do you think three M is going to stay here if we don't have an airport? Well, I don't know how many of their executives fly, but I imagine if they couldn't fly in here and have people from corporate come to visit, that would that would hinder their that would operations. That would be a problem. And Wyndham, I think that would also be a problem okay, for Wyndham. Sure, and sure. if anybody, you know, uh, I, I remember a couple of years ago, uh, North Dakota's tax codes were very uh, amicable for business. And some, some people came in and they were going to set up a huge corporation in, in Fargo. And they were all excited about it. And they got off the plane and it was like 30 below. And they're like, <laughs> we're going to go live in some crime because uh, this is a little too cold. But South Dakota also has a very appealing uh, tax structure for people. And um, there's low crime. Uh, housing's inexpensive. Um, but you need these little things to get that money to come into your state. Yeah. And, and transportation is no small thing. Yeah. That that three hour drive to get on an air, on an airplane that can be a deal breaker. Yeah, yeah, we may not charge you an income tax, but people, business people who you know work outside of the state, who are coming from out of the state, who mm -hmm. have corporate headquarters in other places, they want those amenities, right. and that's that that always transcends culture war stuff. Yeah. People want the the nuts and bolts that'll make their lives better. Right. Can I can I, do I have good roads? Do I have good airplanes? Do I have or air service? Do I have good schools? And that's why. I, I mean, I like what you said about how this isn't a culture. Essential air service isn't a culture war right. issue. Right. To make our lives better on a daily basis, I've never seen a debate about guns or prayer in schools or anything like that that makes our daily lives practically better. Essential air service? Yeah, I may not fly, but there are a lot of people in Aberdeen and a lot of people who make money on those who fly to Aberdeen whose lives will be made worse if we lose that service. Right. And whose lives will be kept better if we keep that service. And having said that, that rolls right over into our interview that we're about to have because uh, some people think the NEA is frivolous. Some people don't understand. You know, they think you can look at a picture on the wall and, and that's what art is and we're done. We're going to go a little more in depth with that. Uh, I, I, uh, my good friend and, and, and a very talented artist in her own right uh, and a professor at uh, NSU sat down and talked with me about what's happening uh, with the NEA and with art in general and why art is important and should be funded. So right now, uh, let's uh, listen to Sarah Christensen Blair. Hello. Hi, Sarah. <laughs> and um, what exactly is your job title? Um, my job title is Associate Professor of Art at Northern State University here in Aberdeen, South Dakota. And you, what is your uh, level of education? Um, I am in the last phases of my PhD, but my degree for teaching art is the MFA, so so, the Master of Fine Arts. Suffice to say, you know a little bit about art and how art functions in society? Yes, I, I would hope so. Yeah. Okay, perfect. That's, <laughs> that's why I wanted to talk to you. Um, because and I, I will never make a comment again because then I get put on a show. No, I'm just kidding. No, it's a, that, well, yeah, well, we did talk about your, you, you asked some really good questions, and I think you were half kidding with some of them, but you half kidding, that's my job is to jokingly bring up good points, and so I appreciate when people do it and your question was how deep well, to, to sum it up was you talked about an issue but you didn't cover the entire issue right here are some things that I was thinking about um, which we then went back and covered and in this topic I don't know if we're going to be able to cover everything about why art is important right but the new budget just defunded the NEA correct Yes, of course. It's always the first target is the arts. And so. what exactly, if people don't know, uh, briefly, what does the NEA do? Okay, so the, the NEA stands for the National Endowment for the Arts. And so it was a fun set up uh, years ago to make sure that, I think the tagline was, you know, making sure that we have arts in America, good art in America. Mm -hmm. Now they've actually changed it to be a lot shorter um, so that it's a little bit more marketable, but the NEA is really set up for, so that state and local and national levels of government can improve art education, out art reach, out art, art outreach, and uh, other arts activities, including music, theater, art, dance, mm -hmm. um, creative writing, poetry, kind of goes the whole gamut. Uh, it also is linked to the NEH, which is the National Endowment for the Humanities. And this, uh, the NEA doesn't obviously pay for all of the art education that people get on a state-by-state -state basis, but, it, but it, it kicks in a pretty good chunk and it, does a, it helps quite a bit, correct? Yes, and it also has a lot of grant programs. The one thing, like in South Dakota, for instance, I think the South Dakota Arts Council, which is our main art funding and organization uh, entity, I think it's about 50% from the NEA. Mm -hmm. So if they cut the NEA, we're going to have to somehow 
figure out how to fund that and to continue programs that affect every community, especially in South Dakota, the rural areas. So. Now, uh, for people, well, first of all, we we're spending millions of dollars uh, every week so that the president can go to Mar-a-Lago. I want to put that in, on top of this. <laughs> Uh, but then, uh, since we're people want their money to go to useful things, yeah. why should I care if uh, your kid knows how to paint a flower on a pot? Who, right. what, what, what difference does that make? How is that even? Well, I think one thing that always hits home for people before I get into the, like, the importance of art education mm. and art, art outreach is that there's an art economy that mm. is maintained by the NEA for as little as the budget of the you know, national budget it takes, the amount of output around an art event, music, theater, art, is massive mm -hmm. because you have people coming to an event, you have ticket sales, you have restaurants and hotels. And so there is a lot of art economy that happens. And I think that's the first thing people forget about is that, yes, there's some input, but actually the amount of money that comes from the NEA right. generated in local areas is, is unbelievable. Uh, so I think that's important. But the reason that art is art, music, theater dance, all those fun facets. I just don't want to always say visual art since I'm a visual sure. artist. I'm very <laughs> careful about that. Understandable. Um, I think the impact that it has is that your child should have an understanding and appreciation for art because art is a way of creating, but also a way of thinking and a way of problem solving that isn't part of the scientific model. It's not linear. It's a different, it's, unex it's harder to explain, which is right. why it's harder to sell. But, and I, I think that that's kind of what I'm looking for. It's, it's, it's not simply that you can stand and look at a painting and go, here's why that's a good painting. Right. It's so that when you are looking at maybe not your tax, maybe your taxes, sure. maybe, maybe the way you design your lawn, maybe the, the way you do the schedule at work, mm -hmm. you've been taught to think of things to come at things with different angles from different perspectives and go, oh, here's how we break this apart and put it back together. Isn't that something that... That, that is very much the case. In fact, um, at the university, they've done lots of studies at Northern State. Um, they've done a lot of economic studies and then also studies with the community for what do employers want mm -hmm. from their recent graduates from the university or mm -hmm. from college. And one of them is writing and reading and talking and being able to function as a human being and a kind person. Mm -hmm. But the other one is always, you know, initiative and creative ways of solving things. Right. Well, as an artist you have to find lots of ways to solve very complex problems in your own way. I always jokingly say in my classes, uh, there's no answers in the back of the book. I might present something to you, and I, mm -hmm. I always say I'm giving you a visual problem, and you have to solve it. But there's no answers. It's just it's all up in your head, and the process is really important. And sometimes that takes a lot of practice. And unfortunately, because the process is not as linear as people would like it, it's harder to understand. Yeah. And there's always the controversy around art, too, so that's always a problem. As soon as someone makes some controversial artwork, then they want to cut the NEA. So yeah. that, that well, was in the 80s. That was really the biggest problem. I remember that because of yeah. the P-Jesus thing. Yeah, um, it's called Piss Christ. Yes. Yes, it's a um, photograph. Maplethorpe. Nope, that, that one was Andre Serrano. Oh, I'm but, sorry. Yeah, uh, Robert Maplethorpe did a series of photographs that depicted, they were lovely photographs, black and white, with um, fluid flying. But um, once you understood that the fluid was male ejaculation, mm -hmm. it became a huge problem. Mm -hmm. um, there was a lot of protests. So... Uh, you know, and then Piss Christ as well. It was a, a, a beautiful photograph of a crucifix, of a cheap kind of plastic crucifix in mm. urine, um, created to bring more of the a capitalist criticism right. to ca Catholic, um, ca I don't know, like marketing and mm. Christian marketing. And so, it, and it was supposed to also be a little tongue in cheek, funny, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and ironic. Of course, people took it whenever you put a crucifix in a in a jar of urine and take a photo, it's obviously going to cause problems. But what a lot of artists want to do is create dialogue and right. talk about it. And right. so, unfortunately, people get offended and they don't want to know anymore. They don't want to know anymore. Like, they're done. So, But, but the, I think that dialogue is incredibly important. And that's something that certainly, I, I'm a comedian, and that, that's right. certainly something that happens in my field all the time. Uh, sometimes with really wonderful results, sometimes with just a bunch of people yelling at each other. But you can't always decide how things are going to be interpreted. Um, I, I guess I, I was listening to Neil deGrasse Tyson on Star mm -hmm. Talk, and they were talking, uh, uh, many things are being defunded yes, right now. Yep. And they were talking about the funding that goes into engineering and research mm -hmm. and science. And for example, Texas Instruments developed the microchip using a lot of grants that they got from the right. United States government that they didn't have to pay back. And the original microchip cost about a thousand bucks a pop, but because the government kept supporting it, the price came down yep. and then everybody else benefited from it. Yep. And that's true with art. Maybe not, you can't necessarily draw as straight of yep. a line, but you know, your employees, if they are t 
taught to think out of the box. Mm-hmm. If they are taught to, you know, understand uh, all of these various things that they bring to the table, they're just going to be better employees, and that is how you benefit. And if they're capable yep. of having a discussion, an intelligent conversation about yes. the the picture of the of the of the the pissed Jesus yes. and and why it's valid and why it's not valid and yep. what we can learn from it, you're going to have a stronger company, right? Yeah. Well, I think so uh, um, or and, my, and citizen and yeah. and husband and you know yeah and and every aspect I think it's the ability to take a challenging subject and maybe you don't agree with it, but have the vocabulary and the ability to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Now, what you were talking about with engineering, um, people love to. S- I had love science and math. My dad's an engineer. I'm good at math. I'm, my parents were a little disappointed. I wasn't at least an architect. Mm-hmm. Um, but I really enjoyed the, the process of creative thinking. But it, I've actually recently traced some of the history of it back to um, industrialization of the United States at the turn of the last century. Okay. Um, there's this, there was this movement, especially after Darwin uh, came out with his theories, um, that in the United States, for instance, especially in the United States, <laughs> there was a huge trend towards anything that was scientific method based. Mm -hmm. So one thing that happened is you had this big influx at that time of the arts and humanities in higher ed. And then all of a sudden things were becoming more mechanized. And so it was the culture shift in the United States was a plus B equals C. And that is how we fund things. And so there was less room for experimentation. Mm -hmm. And so what you see is this. And and then there's also this notion notion of social Darwinism that took over that the survival of the fittest was also the most innovative and industrial led and strongest. And so what you see that in like World War One, World War Two, and then post World War Two America, we have this massive influx of economy and we're making lots of stuff and we're innovating like crazy and we still are. But you have to have the arts there, too. Mm -hmm. You can't just teach the basics. And I'm not saying that there's not a lot of. creative thought put into science and math there's tons so but i think that it's easier to limit the arts because of the controversy and because it's accessible via entertainment even Mm -hmm. though there's many more paths there right beyond entertainment um i I, there's on on 120th and blondo in omaha nebraska there's a building and i don't think it was built by the guy that did the sound museum and do you know who i'm talking about i I always forget this architect's name the guy that did in the simpsons right yeah yeah frank geary frank geary it looks like a frank geary building it looks like they smushed two buildings Mm -hmm. together and it's really interesting um but the the reaction is a combination of that's awesome thanks for doing that in the stagnant uh suburb and oh my god what kind of an abomination is that yeah uh and it's it's clearly the common you know the the melding of art and architecture and well and like the eiffel tower was was art and architecture people hated the eiffel tower from what i understand wasn't supposed to be up forever yeah it was for the world's fair and supposed to come down and now they're putting a glass wall around it yeah yeah yeah. so uh, the, the the reason you push it is because people's perceptions change and because sometimes art takes a minute to sink in and and cooler heads and wiser heads understand this process um do you think what do you think going forward well, I, I think I think what's happening is the current administration is putting everything they idealistically want to cut so mm-hmm. that they can cut, find a place in the middle. Because mm-hmm. I think they're just saying, let's be shocking. Let's The people that voted this administration in obviously are not fans of this notion that art and the national dominance for the arts is not only wasteful, but I, like an elitist sort mm-hmm. of perspective and I, I don't know what happened in the united states when being ed- educated made you elitist um, right. i'm highly educated and i don't have a lot of money so but right. i'm still considered elitist which i think is so weird but we, we've we've done a not yeah. we but the idea anti-intellectual anti-intellectualism yeah. has been sold to us yeah. uh, really successfully well i think that people must feel they're feeling alienated so mm-hmm. that is one area to cut and i think what they're doing is they're saying like let's cut all this stuff and then they're mm-hmm. gonna probably find a middle ground well and i think yeah and I, but i also feel like people are gonna rise up i mean I, yeah. th- there's something to be said for having to defend the stuff that you like well and i think it was five or six years ago in the south dakota was going to cut the south dakota south mm-hmm. dakota arts council mm-hmm. and Man, I've never seen so many people rise up. People right. from every demographic, from every... It wasn't an aisle issue. It was right. all, all over the place. So, and, and, nor, and nor should it be. No, especially because of the outreach it does. I think in big cities, it's it's easier to access. But mm-hmm. at the same time, in rural areas, if you don't have some sort of funding instrument, like the South Dakotans for the Arts, mm-hmm. that's helped by the National Endowment for the Arts, you're, you're going to lose that because mm-hmm. there isn't the teachers because they don't have the staff to have them in the schools. So right. we have the teachers in the schools program that helps bring art 
of all different kinds to these rural schools that don't have a full-time artist. And so it's going to be a huge loss to those areas. And even in the big cities, like if you go to New York right now and you go to the Met, which has got financial issues, but you, it's a suggested donation. Mm -hmm. You you actually don't have to pay very much to get in. Or if you go to MoMA, I think it's like $27 to get in. So that's private versus public. Mm -hmm. And you know, whether or not you want your money going there is, you know, that's part of being a citizen in Mm -hmm. in my opinion. Have you, like the Getty in Los Angeles, mm -hmm. at least when I was there, it was free. Um, yeah. And, uh, but that's a private company. That's a family's, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Foundation. Putting a lot of money into. Yeah. I mean, and a lot of them are a combination. Yeah. I mean, some of them are five, they're nonprofit. Some of them aren't, but, um, you know, the, the big institutions are usually getting quite a bit of help from the NEA. Mm-hmm. Plus, they're really good at marketing. And that's why okay. they bring in the big shows. So, I um, I uh, to to go back really quickly. I honestly don't think they're playing chess. I, I think you people think are looking at the Trump administration like a conventional administration, and they're going, "When people do this, what they're trying to do is get people to do exactly what you said, because that's what has always happened in the past." Right. But nothing about this administration. I don't think you can look to the past for anything with this administration. That's why I think, like, I think they really are just like, no. We're doing all the crazy crap we said, which is fine because that's how we're going to get rid of them more quickly. Um, but no, I, I don't. I don't think they're master chess players. I think they're just uh, uh, over the top and ballsy, and they yeah. say things with conviction. And then people go, "I like it when people say things with conviction." Well, they say like false things with conviction, and then everyone believes them, yeah, which exactly. I find highly. Uh, problematic which is why you need a creative way of thinking to deal with problems like this yeah so, I, I agree. so how do we creatively uh make sure that everybody's represented when not the entire i mean it wasn't a landslide uh win. no not even close so <laughs> not even close you can say that it is all you want but it wasn't so i think we have to make sure that we're understanding information mm-hmm. better and i think that's part of that role of the arts is to understand information mm-hmm. in different ways so. now I, I i asked you about this before the interview and i i just want to touch on it before uh we move along too far do you have concrete examples or do you have you had students who maybe necessarily didn't go on to be artists but who use what they learned in art in in what they're doing or in their sure. lives well there's a couple different examples of you know, people, a lot of people get an art education or a degree in art mm-hmm. or music and don't actually go into that field. Mm-hmm. In fact, I think of all the students that I even went to school with, none of, I think that my husband and I are the only ones that are teaching at, at a collegiate level, which is what everyone's goal was at the beginning, right. you know, but most people are using them, uh, in, using their skills, f- lots of different ways in communications. Um, even people that went to school for you know, traditional graphic design aren't necessarily traditional graphic designers. They're mm-hmm. pushing the envelope. They're not afraid to try new technology. Mm-hmm. They don't get stuck into one little um, corner of the industry. And that can be said for music and theater as well. Uh, one example I have is a, actually a graduate from Northern State um, w- went on and got his MFA. And then he actually is one of the main contributors to the Arts in the Schools program. Um, I just saw him last weekend in Rapid City for the South Dakota. We were ju- judging the South Dakota High School show. And uh, his name's Altman Studney. I'm just giving you a shout out, Altman. Um, but so, for, for instance, he left South Dakota to get an education, came back, and really wants to bring art into the rural areas. So I, and that wouldn't be happen without a grant from right. South Dakotans for the Arts, or excuse me, not South Dakotans for the Arts, South Dakota Arts Council, and then obviously the NEA in conjunction. So I, th- I think you see that across the board in every art form and art education, you're going to get people that are just a little bit better at dealing with m- multiple strategies. Mm-hmm. So. Um, and before we wrap up, uh, is there anything in Aberdeen or in the state of South Dakota that you think is a great place? It, because not everybody takes a minute to go uh, look at art. Not everybody knows where to go find art. Oh, yeah. Well, where would you point people? Well, uh, they just want to take a couple of, you know. Because I really love my job. I'm mm-hmm. going to obviously talk about Northern State University, but hmm. most, hmm, but I have other places. Uh, the main one is we recently, they recently renovated the Johnson Fine Arts Center. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's got a brand new. All sorts of brand new Isn't stuff. Isn't there a really great show in there, there right now? There is, actually, now? in the gallery, which is now mm. part of the Fine Arts Center. It used to be over in the business school, so we're very happy to be. There's a show by this woman named Grasha Brown, who's mm. one of my colleagues and maybe related to the other person across the table from me yeah, right she now. she might be my wife. Yeah. But she it's was, a great show. It's a great show. It pushes the boundaries of what traditional ceramics is. Absolutely. Um, it talks about the not sexy side of ceramics, which mm-hmm. is the leftovers and the mistakes, and presents it in a new way, which mm-hmm. I just think is awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's it's a challenging show for people to look at because they, it's not what they expected. Yeah, yeah. well, I but I, I I have to say I, I saw it in pieces and then I saw the whole thing together, and um, it really knocked my socks off because right. sometimes when you get too close to a piece of work, mm-hmm. you, you it loses impact. Yeah. And so when I saw it 
finished and produced and done. It, it, it re-inspired what I liked about it initially yes. and, and added a new layer to it. And, and, I, and I, I think um, when you do things like this, it is really worth it to read like the artist statement yes. and to try and understand what's going on because yeah. it's, a, it's a really interesting show. And I think having the gallery now in the Johnson Fine Arts Center, mm-hmm. it's right by the box office. Um, we're trying to coordinate most of our events yeah. with either theater or music as well. It's just been awesome. Uh, my husband's the gallery director, Dr. Greg Blair. So mm-hmm. we have all these spousal relations. Welcome to small town America. Sure. Universities, but the other great places in town to go are obviously the um, the Arc, which is the mm-hmm. Aberdeen um, Arts and Recreational mm-hmm. uh, Center, just down the street um, from the university. And then there are a few other local places. There's um, a local co-op gallery in the mall, mm-hmm. and then um, there's also a few you know a few other small pockets of art all over. And, and Presentation College has a small gallery that they're renovating right now. And Greg did a show downtown at the Dakota... We had the Dakota Prairie Museum, yeah. which is also a beneficiary of the NEA and the NEH. So. And that was just this really fun interactive show. It's not yeah. there anymore, right? No, um, it was part of a group that he created, a sculpture group of mm-hmm. former students, um, current students, and himself. Mm-hmm. And they actually have a show up right now at the ARC. Nice. So, yeah, kind of channels their inner childhood a bit. Yeah, it was yeah. a lot of fun. And I think it, uh, it certainly wasn't what I expected. And I think especially if you've never been to an yeah. art museum or interacted yeah. with art, it was it yeah. was probably, it would give you a different perspective on yes. things, which I, is what it's all about. Yeah, the current one is a big installation that definitely awesome. gives you a different perspective. I went Very in and I was cool. like, ooh, <laughs> this is cool. All right. Well, uh, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. Right. And uh, and keep up the good work and Thanks keep up, keep fighting the fight. And uh, keep listening to the Code of Free Press podcast. Thank right. you, Sarah. Thanks. <laughs> This has been the Dakota Free Press Podcast. Now, if you guys want to hang out, Friday nights, you go to... Friday night at the Ward here in downtown Aberdeen. Uh, We have the Progressive Happy Hour from 5 to 7. Come talk with like-minded, curious... And uh, somewhat intelligent people. I've found intelligent people. i found intelligent people. Sometimes I find people that are way too intelligent. (laughs) But either way, you can have a beverage, order some pizza. They've got good chow there Mm -hmm. and good conversation. How better to start your Friday night off than with good conversation with good neighbors about things that matter to South That starts at 5? Starts at 5, runs through 7, sometimes runs later if people keep talking. Sounds good. And uh, once again, if you want to throw a couple bucks in the tip jar, we would greatly appreciate that. If uh, you're interested in any Spencer Dobson comedy, related issues it's www.spencerdobsoncomedy.com and with that i think we got another one in the game you bet we've got it so thanks for tuning in and uh, any questions send them through the comment section on dakotafreepress.com send us an email i'm cory c-o-r-y at dakotafreepress.com always glad to hear from you thanks guys we'll see you next time